Welcome to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. I'm Amanda. And I'm Elizabeth. Thanks for joining us today. A few months back, we talked with Barry Ward about the rising input costs, and herbicides were one product that was an emerging concern. Today, we've got Dr. Mark Lautz, our OSU weed scientist, joining us to discuss how we can minimize the impacts of herbicide shortages and price increases on your operation. Mark, could you take a moment and introduce yourself to our listeners? Sure. Mark Lautz, uh, weed scientist at Ohio State, been here for a long time. Uh, since early 80s, late 87, cover soybeans, corn, wheat, forages, basically applied stuff, weed management. Excellent. We're glad you're joining us today because you've got a lot of knowledge on weed management and how we can make some adjustments, hopefully. So to start off with, what herbicides are we seeing concerns with limited access to as we head into this season? Well, I never have enough information on this, but glyphosate is certainly the one that everyone is has been most concerned about. I think there are some other ones that I heard about some 2,4-D issues. Um, And then aside from, you know, that there are cost increases. So also glufosinate, the various Liberty products. I've also heard there's a finite supply of those. Um, And then the price is up as well. So um, for example, BSF told us we're only making so much Liberty. We're not increasing production. Um, So that's pretty much the way that goes when we're out, we're out. So those are the ones that I've heard about the most. Uh, I don't, I don't get enough information on residual herbicides. I don't know if residual herbicides are short. I have to assume that if this is an issue of product, uh, product being made in China, at least part of it and not getting it here, that everything can be in short supply. So what are the weed escapes that we should really be looking out for? You know, based on our surveys, the ones we're always targeting um, you know, our giant ragweed, common ragweed in areas, uh, mare's tail, water hemp, and then we don't have much palmer amaranth, but certainly looking out um, for that one. And then I think late grass, um, in some cases, um, burr cucumber reared its head pretty big time last year, which I think was kind of amazing because there's always been some, and then all of a sudden we had here when it just went ballistic for whatever uh, reason. So we're always focused on those. I, you know, keeping in mind that when we have Glyphosate, glyphosate is more than just a grass herbicide, right? Even though there's some inclination of people to think that in the post-emergence application, especially. So it's taking care of a lot of weeds still, especially in the burn down, but also in the post. So, you know, if you're post, you're just going after giant ragweed, water hemp, and grass, and the giant ragweed and water hemp are glyphosate resistant. Yes, you probably don't need glyphosate. You can mix something with a grass herbicide, you know, depending on your system. Um, But, you know, if you're, if your residuals, if you have one of those years when your residuals don't last long enough because your soybeans in canopy or whatever, or just have a lot of rain and you start to have other weeds escape, you know, then the Liberty or the 2,4-D or the dicamba without the glyphosate is going to probably struggle more. And so you're sort of looking for some other weeds and the same thing in the burn down. I mean, depending if you've done a fall application or not, you know, you burn down, you can have a pretty messy situation or one that's, that's not bad. And then the pretty messy ones where you have chickweed, dead nettle, and just a whole bunch of stuff. Yes, you're going to probably have 2,4-D out there still if you can get it or dicamba um, or something else, but the glyphosate is really helping pick up a lot of those. And so once you pull it out um, of that mix, then you're starting to find out that your 2,4-D with just a residual or whatever you've done there, um, you know, you start, you're going to struggle a little bit more and start to see some of those uh, weeds come through. But I think we're always focused on what we call the big five, which is the pig weeds, um, you know, the water and plum ring around the two rag weeds and mare's tail. So if someone is struggling to find glyphosate or just doesn't want to pay the higher price this year, what would you expect to see happen if they take glyphosate out of their management system completely this year? Completely? I think, I think that's our assumption is that I should back up and say our assumption is probably not good. I guess one of the, there's a couple of different ways. It, it may be a situation where you don't get any glyphosate and maybe and we were thinking more along the lines where you would get some and you'd have to decide, okay, which fields do I really need glyphosate on or do I just need it in my burn down and I don't uh, need it in my post. Um, and so, you know, certainly, you know, I think I just kind of covered that. Um, but, you know, once you start to uh, take it out of the burn down, um, you know, 2,4-D struggles with, uh, the mint family, you know, the hen bit and the dead nettle. 240 has no activity on chickweed, you know, no activity on grasses. So when you start to put another burn down situ- burn down program together that doesn't have glyphosate in it, 
let's say you're going to use 2,4-D or dicamba and you're going to have to put something with that. You're going to start to see some, some of those escapes. If you have bluegrass, you know, we had a lot of conversation about any of bluegrass among my counterparts sort of in surrounding states because it's on the increase. And that's one that in a burn down, we don't deal with a lot of grasses and burn downs, right? Necessarily. We're kind of April-ish, early May. Yeah, maybe have a little bit of foxtail starting to emerge, but bluegrass has started to become more of an issue. And so that's one that you really have to figure out, okay, what, what do I do? What do I do with this? You know, I can't uh, go after go after it with glyphosate. Um, so that it's it's one of those things that, yeah, you can, I mean, I could probably go down the list of weeds we deal with and say, well, this one's going to be worse and this one's going to be worse and this one's going to be worse. But I think, you know, in general, you're going to start to see um, that what other, whatever else you use for a burn down is, is just going to start to struggle. So now if you do a fall application and you start really clean, I mean, we've known this for years. And I think a lot of farmers who do fall applications know this, you know, even without a residual in the fall, you can have a field that's really very clean into April and almost into May sometimes. And you'll see early emerging giant ragweed and some of the early, early emerging spring annuals and 2,4-D will probably wipe those out, right? You just put it with some uh, another herbicide that's got some residual and a little bit of knockdown. So um, that's probably the best answer I can get without sort of going down a list and saying, okay, well, this will get worse and this will get worse. Yeah, I think you hit most of what we see in the field across Ohio anyways. Um, but what will it look like if we don't have that for post application? Or how, if someone does have it for a few acres, how would they designate which acres to go with Roundup versus an alternative in their post? So in the post, and I think about soybeans here more, because in corn you have just more options, right? So in corn, we, we're, we sort of get focused on beans because those weeds I mentioned, you know, the big five are more problematic there. You know, in corn, you have a number of herbicides that have grass activity, right? Um, Lotus, Impact, right? Shield X, you've got, and you can mix those with, with various products and they have broad leaf activity. So we don't worry about, I think, corn as much. I think we're okay. There may be cost increases and shortages there. So if you come back to beans and look at our programs, you know, obviously if <laughs> it's not a good year to plant around a pretty beans, if you can't get Roundup, right? Not a good option. Non-GMO, it, I guess it shouldn't affect, but you know, then it depends on your system. So if you're in the Liberty Link or the Liberty Link GT27, you're pretty much committed to Liberty. And the Liberty Link GT27, you could, you know, I guess go with straight glyphosate, but you're pretty much committed to, I'm going to use a glufosin right there. Um, and then I'm going to put a grass herbicide with it. And given that your pre has worked well, you know, residual has cleaned up some of the weeds that Liberty struggles with, lamb's quarters, red root pigweed, and some of those, you know, that, that should work fine in that program. On the Liberty Link GT27, you have a choice of using a grass herbicide or glyphosate with a Liberty. Um, and certainly you can use the grass herbicide there. So, you know, if you get into some other perennials, you know, maybe glyphosate would, would help you out, certainly. You know, on the other systems, so on the Enlist system and the Extend, you know, if you take the glyphosate out, your basis is either dicamba or 2,4-D with a grass herbicide. There are in some antagonism issues. They generally uh, recommend increasing the grass herbicide rate um, and if you have, for example, glyphosate in that mix still, or you're using glyphosate instead of a grass service, so you don't have as many of those issues with um, trying to control um, grass. You will, you'll just generally see some other weeds, um, I think, come through. That'll be a case where if you came back to the field and you saw my pre really didn't work and I've got a bigger mess than I anticipated, not just the glyphosate resistant weeds that I know I don't need glyphosate for, then you're going to want to put some glyphosate in there probably because a 240 in the dicamba will, will struggle. I should point out here that, you know, in the dicamba system, the extend system, we also have a, a lot of people who plant those beans because they like those beans and don't necessarily use dicamba post, right? They use it pre, and we also have major dealers, distributors that won't spray dicamba post, I think still on those beans. So that's a consideration, right? So if you if you use that system and you're determined not to use a uh, glyphosate post, if you have the extend, you're going to have to use dicamba. And if you have the extend to flex, you're going to be able to use Liberty there. So um, it's a matter of what my basis is in that. So if I've got one of those systems and I know Liberty or 2,4-D or dicamba is my basis and I'm willing to spray it post, you know, the question is, do, can I get by with a grass herbicide or should I put the glyphosate in to help with some other weeds? I think is maybe the best way to, to look at that. Mark, you've described a lot of different scenarios that sound pretty field specific to me. So how does scouting play into being successful with these alternative approaches? 
Well, um, you know, if you're going to start to modify programs on the fly, scouting is important. And one of the <clears throat> places we've gotten to because our herbicide programs really are very effective um, overall is we choose them the previous fall or winter. And I think then we decide to just run with those everywhere and they've been comprehensive enough that they largely work. So once you uh, change that and you don't have application mixtures that are as comprehensive and you start to worry about, okay, well, if I, I'm taking this herbicide out, so what? happens if I have this weed. That's when, you know, scouting becomes um, really more important. Um, and so that's a case where if you can get a last look at a field, I mean, you could try to get, I think, a look at fields several times before you spray the burn down or the post, but knowing that people have a, a big workload, um, if you're paying somebody to do that, that probably works a little bit better. But certainly if you can drive and spend a few minutes in fields and kind of get a handle on what the weed population is a couple of weeks before you're gonna spray, and then as you get closer, um, maybe again, that'll let you do more modification. So again, you could pull into a field. Uh, if you had a number of fields that you got fall applications on, but not all, you could kind of pull into some of the falls and take a look around and say, I'm good with 2,4-D with like a Valor XLT here, right? Or something like that, or sharpen with 2,4-D and a Valor XLT. And you may pull into some others you didn't do a fall application um, or the fall for whatever reason just didn't work, which it, it almost always does. But, um, and look at that and say, uh, no, I can't get by with that. Like I'm gonna have to use some of my glyphosate in this field really to do what I want. Now, the other thing that happens here in the burn down is if we get a really wet late spring and we have scarcity of glyphosate and things like that, that all gets a lot tougher. So one of the things we have kicked around is it puts more pressure on your residual herbicides is be on the early side. So when you're burned down, if you get weather to apply the burn down the second week of April, knowing that you maybe have a longer range forecast, it's a little bit wet, you might say, okay, this year, I'm just going to do it. I've got small weeds, I've got decent weather, my post will probably handle what I what I do later. And you always have the option to put residuals on at planning if you want to. I mean, if you don't want to put them out that early, it becomes a more application intensive system. And one of the things I should say is that the more application intensive your system is, the more ability you have to reduce the complexity of the mix, if that makes sense. So if you're just going to do like a burn down follow with a residual followed by one post, it's got to be good, you know, really comprehensive. If you're going to say, okay, well, I could do one early, come back with another one at plant or do two post applications, you have more ability to, to cover the, you know, use a second one to cover what the first one didn't do possibly or some breaks. Um, and, the, and the same thing, I think for the post, if you come into fields, you're going to have some that break early. You may have uh, fields with heavy water hemp that your pre doesn't hold as well, right? And so you need to be in there earlier. Um, and you have others that, you know, giant ragweed may be cruising through. And you may have some that you're looking at it thinking, I got, I have a lot of time here. And I also um, can possibly just pull the trigger now with a lower rate, which kind of gets into another question, which we can address, I guess. Looking at field specific stuff, but even more specifically the timing and the rates for those post applications. And um, you mentioned quarter by quarter application, which is a little bit before my time, I think used to be done more often. And does that come back into play here too? Yeah. So if you've uh, tracked what we've done long enough and been around long enough, we played around with a program that was developed in Arkansas originally, and we came back and modified it for use here. And this is a program where you go out post-emergence with a quarter of your typical use rate when weeds are less than one inch tall. It's a systems type approach. And then you come back three weeks later for a second quarter rate. If you miss that timing up to two inches tall, you used half a rate and you could come back with a quarter or a half a rate um, in a few weeks. And it worked really well. We had some growers that tried it and some dealers. This was before Roundup Ready came along. And so then Roundup Ready came along, right? And, and the price was in the seed and the price of glyphosate plummeted. And so that kind of went out the window. So it's, it's application intensive, but you know, what it taught us is, and we know this, you know, weed size is everything in terms of rate. So coming back to, you know, what I addressed in that last question, you may come into a field, it's the second week of June, you've got beans doing really well. You don't have a lot of weeds and they're small and you have a couple of things you can do there. You could say, well, you know, I don't have a lot of weeds. I'm going to wait a couple of weeks or you could look at it and say, well, you know, everything's one to two inches tall. I think I can get by with at least shaving rate somewhat. Um, and we always get nervous to say, to advise cutting rates. And that's why I talked about that systems approach, which we know works. But, you know, you have the option to look at some of those and go, okay, I, I don't need as complex a mix or um, certainly I'm early enough. I don't need glyphosate here or I can, I know I can cut rates based on my experience. 
um, right? So that type of a thing. And then also, again, with the application and intensive application approach, you when you do that, you possibly open the window to have some escapes, which you also have to monitor. And so in addition to that first scouting to, to, to say, okay, I don't need as much herbicide in this field and I want to spray now, your second scouting would be three weeks, two, three weeks after to say, okay, it's fine. I have a canopy developing. I have a few really small weeds and I'm good or no, you know, I need to put on something else, even if it's not a full rate, but the earlier your timing is and the more application intensive you are, the more flexibility you have in cutting rates and modifying your, your program. Yeah. And just to reinforce what you said, cutting rates, but only where you can handle it. And also you might not be cutting it across the board too. Maybe you can get by with a quarter rate, but you need to go back out and scout and see if you do need to make another application with that. Exactly. It's a systems approach. We'll, we'll float it back out um, this spring. Um, it's, 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 a neat, it's a neat approach, but it's very application intensive. Weather can get in the way of it, but you have various options throughout that. But yeah, you're you're exactly right. And we never advocate, hey, you can just cut rates because you have to ha- you have to have enough experience to know I'm on very small weeds, I can cut rates, or I've used this program before and I know I can, but the caveat is later scouting and making sure it worked. Yes, always. Yeah, this is going to be interesting. I think the information you provided is helpful, especially for those of us who um, are of like the roundup generation where we haven't really known anything else. So um, while it has broken down with some weeds, it still, like you mentioned early on, covers a lot of things for us yet that maybe we kind of take for granted at this point as we look at trying to control the weeds that are resistant to roundup. Yeah, it helps to have a little gray hair in this situation. <laughs> yeah, it always does. <laughs> a, little bit, a little bit of pre round of ready experience. I will say we also have the article we uh, put in corn last month. That was a combined thinking of six states where we had more detail on this whole no glyphosate or substituting glyphosate issue and, and had some specific recommendations for different types of burn down. And I would always say, you know, never hesitate to contact us if you want uh, more information. Yeah, I'm sure you and your team are going to do a great job of providing information through the corn newsletter. So that's one resource. Um, But another is the weed control guide. Do you want to share how our listeners could access that resource and how it can help them? Yeah, so I don't have the website off the off the uh, on my fingertips. I it's it's the extension eStore, and you can search for the weed control guide. You get a PDF um, or a hard copy. The hard copy is more expensive, but you get the PDF with it. Um, Yeah, it's a good year once you start. Um, tweaking programs and trying to figure out, okay, what does this specific type of burn down do versus this? And what am I getting from this herbicide? It's a good time to revisit the ratings in there. I mean, I've had some requests for people to say, can you outline how all these different herbicides work in a burn down or rate them? And I've told several uh, people, yeah, we, ha- we have that. It doesn't necessarily have everything you want because we may have only certain combinations in the burn down table that makes sense, but um, you can usually find that information uh, in there. It's a good time to become more familiar with a guide for sure. Yeah. And that's, I think it's extensionpubs.osu.edu, but I'll put that link in the show notes so people can easily access it. Um, Any other resources? I know you guys put videos out sometimes as well. Yeah. Well, I need to probably do some videos on this. We have um, one of the things we didn't cover talk about here was cover crops and trying to burn down cover crops. And I'll just say to, to kind of um, not, uh, get into it big time. We have we uh, we did four fact sheets on cover crops that are part of the Take Action program. Um, Melissa Essman, who works with us, did um, those uh, with help really from everybody in the region. Um, in the end, and one of those is how to burn down cover crops, how to terminate cover crops, and that's on uh, our website. Um, I'm trying to think of what uh, the Take Action. So if you go to I Will Take Action uh, website, you can find it. Um, find that fact sheet there, the cover crops. It's a series of four, um, species selection, termination, what you get for weed control and residual herbicide issues and establishment. So that, that kind of covers what your options are. All right, Mark. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, I think we'll probably have you back on in the spring to go over some reminders on weed control, especially those tough weeds. Um, but thanks for your insight here. We always appreciate you spending time with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. Join us again in two weeks for our next episode.